But today we are glad that you have chosen to worship our God, that you're here to celebrate the, the, the greatest event in the history of the world, the resurrection of God's Son, our Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ. And in fact, hopefully as you'll hear today, everything is about Jesus. And we're in the process of finishing up this week a, a four-week sermon series where I have been preaching through some of the I am statements that Jesus makes in the New Testament. Now he makes uh, a bunch of these I am statements, and I'm only covering four of them, this week being the fourth one. And, and this week uh, we are on to the statement where Jesus says, uh, I am. I am the resurrection and life, as it says on the screen. If you haven't found it in your bulletin, there are some sermon notes. If you need a Bible too, there's some in the chairs in front of you possibly. Uh, you're welcome to use an iPhone or iPad if you've got that. And you got you version is a good version of the Bible. But uh, today we're looking at this statement that I think really fits uh, Easter, the very best of all of Jesus' I am statements. This, this I am the resurrection and the life. And then he continues on and he says, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this resurrection and what exactly is a resurrection, right? And, and just to be real clear, uh, a resurrection is when something dies and then what? It comes back to life, right? The, the resurrection. Now, I actually saw a resurrection happen years ago. Uh, it wasn't a person. It was a bird. It, it, it was still cool, though, right? right? Even though it was a bird, it was still kind of cool. Let, let me tell you about it. Shortly after I moved into my seminary apartment, I went to seminary in the Twin Cities at Bethel Seminary, and uh, I, I, I'd literally lived there for, I don't know, a couple of weeks. And was just kind of getting the lay of the land, figuring out life, moved to the big city in the Twin Cities. I'd been a South Dakota boy most of my life. And so just kind of figuring things out when all of a sudden I, I, I just hear this tremendous bang on the picture window outside of my seminary apartment. And, and just bang. And I'm like, what was that? Right? Now, now, I hadn't lived there long enough to really have somebody who might be pranking me, so I don't think anybody was, like, throwing their shoe at my window trying to get my attention. There wasn't any love interest, you know, calling on me at those days, you know. <laughs> I was single and fully living the single life. And, uh, and so it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't anything like that. And I lived on the second floor, so it was a long shot that it was something random. But it was loud, right? And so I went outside to investigate what it was, uh, to figure out what was going on. And, and when I got there, I see this loud but somewhat disorientated blue jay. And, and so I suspected that, that he must have probably had some sort of collision with my window. And, and of course, as I got closer to this blue jay, and blue jays are good-sized birds. And I, I didn't grow up seeing blue jays. I don't know if they don't cross the border into South Dakota or if I was in the wrong places or what. But I, it wasn't until I moved to seminary that, that I realized, like, blue jay is a formidable bird. That's, that's a good-sized bird. And so, so he flies away just squawking angrily. And, and, and I'm like, all right, mystery solved. And so, of course, I, I turn and I start walking back in the building. And, and right as I get to the entry to my, to my seminary apartment building, I hear another loud bang. And this time it was clear it was my window, right? And so I turn back and, and, and look, and here now is, is this very same blue jay laying dead on the bush below my window, the second floor window. And I just kind of shake my head. I mean, you know, stupid bird, right? And so, so I'm like, well, what do I do now? And, and it's, I mean, it's literally just laying there on the bush. So I'm like, a little curious. So, you know, I, I go over and look at it and... You know, you take a stick first because you don't want to touch it, so you poke it with a stick. That's, 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 you know, the stick is magic, right? Anybody ever poke something dead with a stick? Well, I poke it with a stick, right? And it's dead. So uh, curiosity gets the best of me, and I pick it up, and I'm looking at the feathers, and, uh, and it, it's, it's, it's a beautiful bird. I mean, just, just beautiful, absolutely astonishingly beautiful bird. And, and I, I'm looking it over, and I'm like, well, now what do I do with this stupid bird? And I'm like, all right, I'm going to go throw it in the dumpster because I just... Couldn't leave it laying there. Well, if you've ever been in Bethel and you know where the old seminary housing was, the dumpsters are at the end of about a two-block-long parking lot at the other end from where I lived. All right, I'll make my way over to these garbages and then throw this bird away. Because I didn't want to throw it away into my garbage in the apartment. It'd start stinking eventually. So, so I start walking down this, this parking lot and, and uh, just studying this bird and its, its 
feathers and, and, and just the colors and, and the radiance of the sun kind of shining off and reflecting off of the feathers. And, and, and I make it all the way to this dumpster, right? And I'm just lifting, you know, those dumpsters with the big plastic lid. So, so I'm like leveraging this giant stinky, you know, garbage smelling lid up and the smells are starting to waft out. And, and I'm about to throw this bird into the garbage when all of a sudden it seems like a bobcat is living on my right arm, <laughs> right? And, and all of a sudden, uh, I, just like this bird has come back to life, and, and, and it's screaming, and it's pinching, and it's clawing, and it's biting, and it's pecking me at a rate that's unexplainable, frankly. And I mean, it seemed like the thing had four birds and or four four beaks and like ten claws. And I mean, it, it's just it, it's ripping me up. And and if you've ever had an experience like this, it takes your brain a little while to recognize the pain, right? And so you don't let go right away. You're holding on to it, and then all of a sudden you're like hey, idiot, let go of the bird, right? But it take, there's a delay, and so it is shredding my hand, and finally I let go, and it flies off and squawks and screeches, and I, I, I never see it again. And, and then, of course, I have to do the walk of shame with a bleeding hand all the way back across this parking lot to go patch myself up back in my apartment. And then... That's my resurrection story. That's the best one I got to tell you, right? Uh, that, that's all I had, and I thought I'd share it with you today. So, so that, that's my resurrection story of something that I thought at least was dead, but wasn't, came back to life. Now today we're looking at something that was dead and is coming back to life, and, and, and something, a much greater story, of course, the story of when Jesus says that He is the resurrection and the life. And when Jesus says this, uh, what a a lot of people don't understand is he actually said it in the context of, of, of a much broader story. Jesus says this in the context of a story about another guy actually who died, but who also didn't stay dead. A man by the name of Lazarus. And I want to read to you that story, and then we're going to look at three different ways many of us die on the inside, and, and how the, the resurrection of Jesus brings what is dead back to life. So if you want to follow along, we're going to be in the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John's the fourth of the Gospels, and we're going to be in John 11, starting in verse 1, and we're going to work our way through a bunch of verses here. So John 11, verse 1, is where we're going to start. And this is what the Bible says. It says, And now a man named Lazarus was sick. And we're going to find out in just a little moment that he wasn't just sick, but he was so sick that he was going to die. You see, Lazarus was a man from a town called Bethany, a little village, and he had a sister named Mary and Martha. You might have heard of those sisters before. And then in verse 3 it tells us, and because Lazarus was sick, it says, So the sisters sent word to Jesus. And what did they tell him? They said, Lord, the one you love, our brother Lazarus, the one you love is sick. Now this was bad news in the middle of good life. And unfortunately, if I can just pause for a, a little moment and acknowledge, there, there are a lot of people here who, who are hopefully celebrating today a little bit, celebrating great things in this season of your life. But while there's a lot of people who are celebrating things, there's also a good number of people who, who are probably hurting a little bit right now today, right? That, that you may have heard some similar bad news. And, and in fact... Maybe some of you, maybe you've, you've directly heard some, some of that very bad news, that sort of news that, you know, that you hear that the one you love is sick, right? Jesus loved Lazarus, and he gets this news that, Jesus, the one you love is sick. Maybe someone close to you has got cancer, or, or something bad is going on. And I just want you to know, if you're here today, and that's you, and you're struggling with something, we at Glory Baptist Church are here for you. And now in the, the middle of all of this, Jesus getting word that his friend is, is, is deathly ill, Jesus says something amazing. Watch what he says in verse 4. Jesus says this, when, when he heard this news, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. And then he says, no, it's for what? He says, this sickness is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now this is the very thing you, you would never ever want to happen. But God is still going to bring the glory to Himself through this worst kind of news that you could ever imagine. 
And we'll come back to this verse in a little minute. And let me give you a, a quick summary of verses 5 through 14. Uh, you can read this on your own later if you would like. But basically, everybody is believing at this point that Jesus is going to come and help. I mean, Jesus has been performing miracles all over the place. He's healed the blind. He's, he's made the lame walk. He's done, he's done some amazing things in his ministry at this point. And, and then Mary and Martha, uh, they send a note that, Hey, Jesus, you're one of your best pals. He, he's sick on the verge of maybe death and dying of, of this illness. And we want you to maybe come do something about that, right? But what is Jesus going to do? Nothing. For two days, Jesus doesn't do a single thing. Whew, right? He hangs out. They're freaking out, and he's just hanging out. And then two days later, he says to his disciples, Hey guys, let's go back to Judea, right? And they say back to Jesus, Hey, hey Jesus, uh, if you go back there, everybody there is going to try to kill you. Which would have been true. But Jesus says, no, guys, Lazarus has fallen asleep and we need to go wake him up. Now, he wasn't saying that, that Lazarus was tired and he was taking a nap. What he was saying is, is a metaphor there. He's saying, Lazarus is dead and we need to go raise him from the dead. And when we dig into the story, what I want us to do is look at three different characters out of the story and and, and one, first of all, is going to be one of the disciples, one of the guys who had been following along with Jesus for a couple of years and studying and learning at his feet. And that disciple is a man you may have heard of, a man by the name of Thomas. And then I want to look at Mary, one of the sisters. And then I want to look at the other sister here, Martha. And we're going to see three different ways that they were dying on the inside. And perhaps at this point in your life, maybe some of you can relate to what one of them was experienced, what one of them was going through, or maybe you've experienced it to some other point in your life. And if you're taking notes, let's start off with Thomas. Some of you can relate to Thomas. He was dead in his doubts, right? He's doubting Thomas, right? We've heard of him. And all through the scripture, he's known as doubting Thomas. In fact, uh, we, we see in this verse in 16, it says, Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said, let us also go that we may die with him. In other words, he, he's kind of doubting what, what Jesus is going to do and doubting what Jesus has said and, 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 and wondering, can this even turn out for something good at all? And I'm curious how many of you on this Easter weekend, how many of you would be honest enough to say that you've had some spiritual doubts at some point in your life? I know I have, right? Most of us, if you're intellectually honest probably have had some spiritual doubts at some point. Because, because I think what happens is, is, is most of us have experienced this. That at some point you've, probably, you, you've prayed some prayer, you've believed that, that God could and thought that He would, but He didn't, and then boom, you're, 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 you're bombarded with doubts, right? And you're wondering, why God, why didn't you do this? I mean, I prayed about it, I, 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 I really wanted it, I thought that it was the way it was supposed to be, God. Or maybe you believed in God and something really bad happened to you anyhow, or bad happened to somebody that you loved, right? And you thought, well, if God is good, why did... God, if you're good, why, why did you let this happen, right? I mean, God, if you're, if you're, if you're all-powerful, as it says, why didn't you put a, a stop to this? And suddenly... You're like Thomas, right? And there's something that's on the inside that's a little bit dead in your doubts. Or maybe, maybe some of you are more like Mary. You're not dead in your doubts. But if you're taking notes, you're dead in your discouragement. You don't see anything good happening. You just cannot seem to get a break, right? You ever felt like that? I have. Mary was very, very, very discouraged. And we see this in verse 20. John eleven twenty. 20. It says, When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet with Jesus. But what did Mary do? Or, let me try that again. Martha went out to meet with Jesus. Mary stayed home. I switched their names around. Sorry. Mary stays at home, right? She's like, 
yeah, Jesus is coming, but why bother going out to see him? I mean, Lazarus is already dead. There's nothing he can do about it anyway. And, and honestly, that, that might be some of you right now. You think, I can't change anything, right? I, I'm always going to feel alone, or I'm always going to feel depressed, or I'm never going to have a marriage that I thought I would have, or I'm just kind of stuck at this thing in life, right? And you're discouraged. And some of you, that may be where you are at right now. I mean, it's Easter, so you're not going to show it to us, right? You put on your good clothes, you show up at church, you put on that good smile, right? Even though it's raining, you're walking in through the rain, you're going, no, it's a great, glorious day, praise Jesus, hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, right? Somebody says, how are you doing today? Oh, fine, Jesus is risen, praise the Lord, right? And we say that, we act that, we, we put those masks on, right? You're smiling on the outside, but on the inside, you're, you're really discouraged. Some people are dead in their doubts. Others are dead in their discouragement. Martha, though, if you're taking notes, maybe you can relate to her. You see, Martha, Martha, she was dead in her delay. You see, God took too long, right? Jesus should have come back to them earlier, but he didn't. Why, why Jesus, did you take so long to get here? Verse 17, we see this. It says, on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb. For how long? For four days. Now, why does the four days matter? Let me just tell you. In the time of Jesus, the time Martha was living, there, there was a commonly held belief that, that that spirit, you know, your, your, your spirit would stick around for, for three days after someone died. It's not a biblical idea, but it was a cultural idea. And they had the belief that, that your spirit would kind of hang around the body for about three days, and, and then it would go wherever your spirit was going, and depending on what you believed, right? And, 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 and so their spirit would be close, kind of just in case they came back. Then the spirit could jump back into the body or whatever. But at four days, Four days, everybody agreed. The spirit was gone, the body was dead. Hope is over. So in her mind, Lazarus wasn't just mostly dead. Any Princess Bride fans? Yeah? He was all the way dead. He was dead dead. He was dead and then some. Four days dead. So dead was he that, that later in the story, Martha... Martha tries to describe how the smell of his body was going to smell if they were to open that tomb, right? And, 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 and in that old King James version, right? Uh, God bless the King James interpreters in the old style, the way they translated the Bible. This is the way that, that Martha describes him. She says, he stinketh. <laughs> right? I love that. That's a holy stink. Like stank nasty. How dead was he? Four days dead. The spirit's gone. Dead, dead. Not mostly dead. He stinketh. Verse 11, it says, Lord, Martha said, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. You took too long, Jesus. Why didn't you do this when you could have done something about this, is the implied, right? Some of you right now, you can relate to those feelings. You feel dead in your delay. You're waiting on some answered prayer on some result. And I know, I, I know a lot of people that are praying and believing that God could actually heal someone, for instance. And because I believe that we serve a God that says all things are possible, yet we pray and we pray and we pray and it just seems that God's not doing it. And so you, you feel dead in your delay. And if that's you today, I hope this will speak to you and, and that you'll never forget that God's delays are not God's denials. And that God, even in spite of things not happening the way that you're expecting or when you're expecting or, or, or whatever might be the case, that just because God hasn't done something yet, doesn't mean that God is not still in charge. That He doesn't still have a plan. 
that He might be glorified in the future through the very thing that you might be going through today. The very thing that you might say you would never ever have wanted to go through. That you never ever would want. So in John 11 I'm reading, and, and Lazarus dies, Thomas freaks out, Mary, she's depressed, Martha, she's mad, and as I'm reading through my Bible, I come to the end of the page. And so, so I flip the page, right? And when I get to the other side of that page, like the whole tone of the story changes. Everything shifts. And I'll read to you what, what Martha said in verse 22. This is what Martha said. On the first page, everything's bad. On the second page, though, everything changes. And she says, But I know, even now, God will give you Jesus whatever it is you ask. So, Thomas freaked out, Mary's depressed, Martha's mad, but Martha says this, I, I know Jesus now, whatever you ask, God will give it to you. She looks at him, even now Jesus, right? Even though we're, we're dead in our delay, we're dead in our discouragement, we're dead in our doubts, she looks at Jesus and says, even now, God will give you whatever you ask. And today, some of you need to have an even now moment with God. You're stuck on that first page. And it's time to turn the page and let faith come alive and believe that even now, all things are possible with God. Some of you are maybe here today because you need to have an even now moment. Even now, when you are discouraged, the presence of God can come in and build your faith. Even now, when maybe you feel all alone, there, 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 that there's no one there to support you, no one there for you. Even now, the Holy Spirit can give you a peace that surpasses all understanding. Even now, even now, God can reach down into your messed up life, into your messed up family, and bring healing and bring harmony and bring forgiveness and bring restoration. Even now, when everything looks impossible, we serve a God who says all things are possible. Even now, maybe. Even now, if you're even if your heart feels cold and calloused towards the things of God, our God, in just one moment, can soften your heart and draw you into His presence. Even now, when something is dead, the resurrection power of Christ Jesus can bring it back to life. And that's exactly what Jesus does in verse 23. Jesus looks at Martha and he says, Your brother will rise again. Martha, of course, answers. And she says, Well, I know Jesus. I know Jesus. He'll rise again at the resurrection of the last days. You see, she was confused. She was thinking of a different resurrection. And then Jesus says in verse 25, He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He didn't say, I am able to resurrect. But he said, I am the resurrection. And then the one who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, it's not just what he does, it's who he is. Write this down. The resurrection is not an event. It is a person. The resurrection is not an event. It's a person. It's not just what he does. It's who he is. Dead things don't stay dead when the resurrection walks into the room. And the resurrection, Jesus, he, he looks at the tomb where Lazarus is sleeping, dead, stinking, dead, 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 not partially dead. And, and sorry about that, my phone. And so he looks at this and he says, Lazarus. Lazarus. Lazarus, come out! Right? And the dead man came out. 
His hands and His feet were bound in straps of linen. Bound in straps and cloth as they wrapped people in those days to put them into the grave. And, and then He's wrapped up and Jesus says to them, He says, says take off these grave clothes and, and let Him go, right? What was dead is now alive. And I, I love the, the contrast in the stories that we have. Jesus is dead in the tomb, and there's a stone that's blocking it. Lazarus, he's dead in the tomb, and there's a stone that's blocking it. Jesus goes to Lazarus, and he, and he tells the disciples, roll the stone away, right? And, and, and when Jesus is in the tomb, uh, the women come walking up, and they're like, uh, uh, when we get there, who's going to roll away this big old stone that's in front of Jesus? And some of you, maybe you've been feeling a little dead on the inside. Maybe you've lost that faith. Maybe you've lost some of your hope and you're feeling dead in your delay. You're discouraged or you've had some doubts and you feel, you feel as if you've been trapped in a tomb. You feel as if you don't have the strength to roll that stone away. And on Easter, I want you to remember that, that Christ has rolled the stone away and that the very same voice that calls to Lazarus and calls him and tells him to come out, come out, Lazarus, come out, the same voice calls to us and you can know that in that same voice and in that one who is the resurrection and the life that your sins too can be forgiven, not at all because you are good, but because He is good. I want you to hear today that you can be set free, not because you're strong, but because He is strong. And you can feel His presence, not because you deserve it, but because He is good. Because you see, the resurrection is not what Jesus does, but it is who He is. Why does this matter, right? Because God in His love, God in His mercy did something for us that we are completely and absolutely incapable of doing for ourselves. You see, God chose to become one of us. God in the flesh, born of a virgin, walking the earth, born of a virgin, right? Why, why does a virgin thing even matter? Because Jesus didn't inherit the sin nature from an earthly father. He inherited a divine nature from His heavenly Father. Therefore, Jesus could be the, the, the spotless Lamb, the Lamb without blemish, the Lamb without flaw, the perfect Lamb. That way He could be the perfect sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins on the cross, where Jesus brutally suffered at the hands of the creation. The very thing He created killed Him. And in those moments, he looked up at heaven. And he said to his Father in heaven, he says, Father, I did what you sent me to do. It is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And if you know the Easter story, it was at that point then that the earth went dark and it shook. And everyone, everyone who had hoped that maybe the Messiah had fallen into despair and darkness, but was going to do something. But it didn't happen. You see, at that point, they didn't realize that it was Friday, but Sunday was coming. They were still stuck on that first page of the story. But with a turn of the page, God would be glorified through the death that no one expected as Jesus was raised. And some of you right now, I'm telling you, you're stuck on that first page. And, and with just one touch from God, you can turn the page to something completely new in life. And I'm not here to tell you that this is going to make everything in your life perfect, right? God gives you new life, but that new life may not be exactly what you were hoping for. New life in Christ doesn't mean that everybody you want to be healed is going to be healed. That's not how it works. New life in Christ doesn't mean that you'll get to live forever, or your hair will never fall out, or anything like that. That's still all going to happen. doesn't mean life will be perfect. Doesn't mean you're going to win the lottery, all that kind of stuff. That doesn't isn't what it means. There we go. We normally start worship at this time. Doesn't mean at all, though, that everything's going to be like you want. But if you've been stuck on that first page of the story, 
with a simple turn of the page, with a, a meeting of God, God can still be glorified in the midst of all of it. God can be glorified through the death as Jesus is raised. If you've been stuck on that first page, one touch from God can change everything. Now what I'm telling you is that life on this new page, that God will be glorified in all things eventually, but it may not be in the moment and you may not understand that fully. But God is good and He is that good. That He can use things from your messed up past, he can use mistakes that you have made. He's made. He can, he can go and use things that you regret. Because He is that good. And so Jesus says to us, I am the resurrection and the life. Some of you have been living dead in your sins. That's what the Bible says. It says we're dead in our sins. But because of what Jesus did, not because we could ever earn it, not because we could ever deserve it, but because of what Jesus did, our sins can be forgiven. We can be made new. Not perfect while we're here on earth, but made new with a promise that things will get better. That's the gospel, folks. That's the good news. It is good news that God did something that we couldn't do for ourselves. Because He is that good. And on this day, the celebration of Easter, of Resurrection Sunday, we are reminded that the tomb is empty. That Jesus is resurrected. That He has risen. And that because of it, it changes everything. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will never die. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we pray in this moment. So many of us, God, have struggled in life. God, we've struggled with things that really hurt. This life is not always the way we would like it to be. We struggle, God, with doubt. I know I've been there, Lord. God, we struggle. We've been discouraged. God, we've struggled with delays where things didn't happen when we wanted. We didn't understand how you were working and what you were doing. But many times, God, that is not for us to know. We are not God, and you are. But God, you tell us through your word that despite all of that, our doubts, our discouragement, our concerns about things not happening the way we would like, that you, nonetheless, are working. And working in all things for the good of those who believe in you. And God, on this day, we've, many of us come here just looking to be renewed and refreshed. We've been living in darkness, Lord, trying to find that hope. And if that's you today, I pray right now that you would find that hope in Jesus. God, we know that you sent your Son into the world to live a life we could not live, to die a death we could not die. God, see, our problem is sin. Each and every one of us are sinners. We're broken. And each and every one of us need a Savior. All of us. And God, because we are the cause, we are the problem, we cannot be the solution. And so God, even though it doesn't always make sense, we know that you chose to love us anyhow, despite the fact we couldn't earn it or deserve it. And so you sent your son Jesus into the world. And God, on this day I just pray that that if there's someone here who's never heard those words, that they would understand that Jesus died for them to take their place, to take their sin away, that they might be reconciled with you. And God, to be in relationship with you, you tell us, all we have to do is turn away from our sin and confess you as our Lord, as our Savior. Maybe right now someone needs to pray that. God, I've been trying to do this on my own for too long. I'm worn out. I need you. 
God, my sin has made a mess of my life. I am broken. I need you. Come into my life, Jesus. Be my Lord and Savior. And in that moment, Lord, we turn away from our sin. All of us as sinners need to turn away from our sin. And God, we turn from that sin and we turn towards you. And Lord, as we are forgiven, because you tell us you will forgive us if we are in you, as we are forgiven, we are set free. God, free. Things of our past don't have to hold us back. We get to turn a new page. The old has gone, the new has come. We are free. So today, do some business with God. If you're here today and you haven't heard those words, turn to Jesus. If you're here today, you're dragging some baggage behind you, you're struggling, you're hurting. God is here for you. We're going to sing here in just a moment, but I would just pray that as we continue on in worship today, if you've made a commitment to Jesus, let somebody know. God, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you sent us Jesus. We love you. We pray you in his high, holy, and beautiful name. Amen. We're going to sing a closing song. At the end of this closing song, there'll be some people up here that you can come pray with. If you have any prayer requests, come on up and they will pray with you. Otherwise, as you are able, let us rejoice and make a joyful noise one final time together as we sing our closing song. Please stand. Please stand.